time, so. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for uh, coming here. It's always lovely to attend the Sunday conventions um, and Philosophy of Games conference. Summits, sorry. Um, it's great to be here. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm on the last day. Okay, I guess that's sort of part of my uh, next slide. I'm really sorry I haven't been able to uh, attending the rest of the conference. There's sort of issues with uh, childcare in Denmark that sort of, you know, take a long time to discuss. And I would like to thank the organizers for trusting uh, a newbie like me uh, with a keynote. Uh, this is the first time I, I give a keynote and um, I've been struggling a little bit with the genre. Because, um, you know, keynotes are, are a very interesting thing. I was tempted to do the sort of very assertive thing. Um, you know, this is my research and thus this is how things are. Um, but then I thought, you know, I, I like to discuss and what a better place to discuss than, than with colleagues that are uh, interested in the same topics but we come from sort of very different fields. So instead of doing an assertive keynote, I thought it was appropriate to do a playtesting keynote. So what I'm going to do today is to playtest some of my current research ideas and wait for your feedback, which can be sort of as cruel and hurting as you want. Um, because, you know, as every good playtesting session should be, I want to get out of here with an improv, improved product. So um, that's what's going to happen in the next 45 minutes. I hope we have some time to discuss. Otherwise, just hijack me. I'm here all day. So hijack me for questions uh, um, and other similar things. And the next 45 minutes are going to be an exciting tour through uh, ethics, video games. I will complaining about Bioshock quite a lot. Those of you who haven't played Bioshock, I'm going to spoil it. Uh, those of you who haven't played Shadow of the Colossus, I'm going to spoil it. Those of you who haven't played uh, Fallout 3, you should be playing it right now, but it's impossible to spoil it. And those of you who haven't played Call of Duty 4, I'm not so sure I'm going to spoil it, but you should be playing it. So I'm basically going to be talking about those games. But in a more um, sort of formal way, uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about. I think, um, so I'm, I'm a weird high kind of hybrid. I'm not technically a philosopher. I'm not technically a, so if I used to be a literary theorist. I'm not technically a game designer. I'm not even technically, I would say, a games researcher. I, because, you know, I have, I have obscure intentions of, of dedicating my future life to the study of reality TV, which is, <laughs> now, honestly, it's just, it's the most awesome type of games you can find out there. So, so here I'm going to try to introduce um, my own hybridity as a practice and how it has affected my current work. And I will start by uh, sort of presenting what I think is the main problem we have right now in, in, the, in the field of ethics and games, and that's the problem of design. I'll explain a little bit more what I mean. I'll do a little bit of uh, philosophical introduction to the philosophy of information and games, which is a framework in which I usually work, or my sort of philosophical framework, um, because I also use sort of other domains. Um, since, since it's a very non-polemic topic, I'll you know, talk a little bit about the ontology of games, because you know, it's something that we can just use three minutes and move on. There's no discussions about that. And then I will define ethical gameplay, and I'll see how we can understand it, moving to my sort of core point, or one of my core points today, and that's that we should get rid of Homo Ludens now and move on to something new, especially when we are designing games. So this is more, all, all this keynote, it's, it's basically focused on how to design better ethical game experiences, or at least not better, but sort of functional ethical games, game experiences. Um, which is what I will introduce sort of close to the end. And uh, my final point will be that, you know, the future of this research is not human, um, but I'll explain that later. Uh, anyway, a little bit about me. I'm an assistant professor at the IP University. I basically teach game design, but I, I've also taught sort of a number of other things. Uh, I have a background in linguistics, literary theory, and sort of postmodern philosophy, and then I took a PhD, or I took my PhD at the IT University on uh, the ethics of computer games, which ended up being that book over there, which has just been published by uh, MIT Press. Um, and I'm currently working on the sequel. What we are going to see today, it's actually uh, the sequel. So you're getting a sneak peek to what I've titled, I'm very influenced by the games industry, so the sequel is probably going to be titled uh, the Ethics of Computer Games to uh, the Lost Books. Uh, I plan on starting a franchise, of course. Um, 
So anyway, uh, again, what I'm going to present today, it's a hybrid work, it's not totally philosophy, it's not totally design, it's somewhere in the middle. How can philosophy talk to the discipline of game design? And I'm also going to present uh, ideas that are part of a work in progress. So feel free to just uh, sort of jump and feel uh, uneasy when you feel so. And give all the feedback possible, please. So anyway, um, when I was done defending my PhD, and I was really happy that day, um, you know, it's, it's a high, it's a physical high. Um, Ian Bogus, who was uh, on, on my committee, then he approached me in the dinner afterwards and he said, okay, so now, now we sort of have a better idea of how the ethics of computer games should be analyzed. So how do we make them? And I've spent the last three years trying to answer that sort of devious question. How do we make ethical gameplay? Because, I mean, we are surrounded by it, right? And I guess that's sort of the most uh, obvious case from the last years is Bioshock, which was sold uh, on the premise of having sort of important uh, ethical dilemmas. Uh, in, in the book, I analyzed Bioshock with great detail. Um, since it was probably the first game, I seem to recall that used the morals as a unique selling point. Uh, probably, or maybe Fable was before, but anyway, in Bioshock you have this dilemma, there's this... How many of you have played Bioshock? Okay, say two-thirds of the audience. That's brilliant. Uh, then then I don't, I'm not going to kill the game. So you have these little sisters, right? And then you have this complex moral dilemma. Shall I kill them or shall I not kill them? I mean, yeah, it can be an ethical dilemma the first time you do it, but the game is, takes like 10 hours to finish, and you do three little sisters per level. Okay, that sounded really terrible. You don't do three little sisters, yeah. Um, so so you, you perform this, this uh, moral choice about three or four times per level in the game, um, and it, it ends up being totally devoid of any ethical meaning. It's just a strategy. Bioshock, it's, it's the example of how we fail designing uh, ethical gameplay. Um, it's not about ethics. It's not about morality. You don't need to use any kind of ethical thinking or um, you don't even experience very much a uh, sort of complex ethical dilemma when you're playing Bioshock. You're just calculating by the end, okay, how much Adam do I need to, you know, kill the boss? Um, of course, you can play it sort of in a more role-playing way and make it sort of over uh, generalizations, but still, it, it's not... Is this what vi video games actually can do? Choose A or B? Come on. We have a problem. We have the problem of design. We have no idea how to design ethics for games. We have this object, which are video games, uh, which we have a sort of a slight idea of what they are. Um, and we are very good at simulating consequentialism, uh, for reasons I think I'll go into in, in, in a while. But is that really exploring the ethics of games? Is, is choosing between killing and not killing a little sister the ethics of computer games? What the best we can do? Well, no. And actually, and thankfully, we have uh, very good examples of games that are out there that create compelling ethical experiences, both using this kind of decision-making uh, if statements but also in more subtle ways. So what I'm going to propose here today is uh, a total redefinition of what we understand by uh, ethical gameplay and um, a technique. I, I'm not very comfortable with using the word method in, in design because it has sort of a very bad reputation. Um, so I, I'll, I'll suggest a technique for approaching uh, the design of ethical gameplay. Um, and it's basically, it's, it's grounded on two principles. If we want to design ethical gameplay, if we want to really push the boundaries of what games can express, can simulate, and can create uh, for players, we need to redefine or re-understand. We don't need to sort of, you know, take all the history of game studies and throw it out. But we just need to think about, okay, what, what are games as designed objects? And um, once we have a, a more clear idea of that, who plays? We have all these kind of player models out there, but that we lack an, an anthropology of the ethical player. I claim, I claim constantly that you know, players can be ethical beings, but who are these ethical beings? How do they work? Um, we don't have models for them. And if you go into the sort of design, uh, game design literature, you will see that you know, we are working on outdated models. All of those things I'll hopefully shatter a little bit today, and I will present both an anthology of games as uh, ethical, games and uh, an anthology or an anthropology of uh, ethical players. So that's going to be the next uh, 
steps. But before, of course, I would like to introduce briefly uh, the framework in which I operate, basically because it explains my, my game ontology. Um, I, I, I use quite a lot of time and effort in, in the book. I'm, I'm, I feel terrible to say like, oh, go out and buy my book. But, okay, so I say it once. Go out, buy my book. I'm done with the publicity. Um, I introduced how the philosophy of information can be used to understanding uh, video games in, in the book in detail. So I thought, you know, maybe this is something we can discuss afterwards. I'll just uh, rush a little bit through it. So the philosophy of information, uh, and especially information ethics, which is the domain in which I feel very comfortable, can be defined, and I quote, as an environmental macroethics based on the concept of data entity rather than life. So we are going, or we are moving away from sort of biology, uh, which is really very nice and comfortable. And uh, so sort of another extensive quote, the philosophy of information is the philosophical field concerned with A, the critical investigation of the conceptual nature and basic principles of information, including its dynamics, utilization, and sciences, and B, the evaluation and application of information, theoretical and computational methodologies to philosophical problems. Um, after working on this uh, domain, awfully close to software design, which is because it's exactly the type of domain I think we can benefit from when we are analyzing complex objects, complex objects like computer games, and if we extend it also to sort of video games. So um, the philosophy of information uh, basically claims this is sort of the, a little bit of philosophy of information for dummies, so I apologize, but um, I like this claim. I like the fact that sort of being is information. We should move away from an ontology that's uh, anthropocentric or biocentric and we should think about an ontology that is based on the concept of information and, you know, walk or jump into that hole uh, together with the white rabbit. If we are getting rid of um, biology, if we are making an ontology that is purely informational, where can we go? Um, and I think, I think the three elements that are very, very uh, interesting and functional when we talk about the philosophy of information applied to video games. Um, I would say the two key concepts uh, when I at least apply the philosophy of information to games would be the concept of infosphere, um, the concept of agency. Agency will be much more crucial towards the end of this uh, talk and the method of abstraction, which is actually a tool that is very, very uh, practical to use, I think. Um, just to introduce him briefly and probably uh, not very uh, detailed, uh, the infosphere is uh, the environment constituted by the totality of information uh, entities, including all agents, processes, their properties, and mutual relations. So basically, if um, being is informational, the environment in which all these sort of data beings exist, it's also of, in, of informational nature. It's an infosphere. It's a, it's a system, it's a, of course it's a complex system, in which we, or data uh, entities, exchange information and therefore sort of exist. Um, in this sense, I've claimed that uh, all games, including sort of non-digital games, are infospheres. Uh, we can encapsulate, uh, the, the sort of the famous, and I really don't want, there's a, there's a number of areas I really don't want to go uh, in the keynote, but we can discuss about them later. The whole concept of the magic circle uh, can be implemented in a slightly more elegant way if we think about games as infospheres. So places where, you know, our agency as uh, players uh, makes sense and then we have a specific methods to interact with other agents and there's, uh, uh, you know, a number of rules and uh, all these kind of um, object-oriented notions that we can use in a second. I'll introduce the object-oriented stuff in a second. Um, so anyway, my main claim is that games are infospheres. They are systems of information where informational agents exchange uh, information uh, using sort of methods pre-designed. Uh, agency is uh, the, probably the, the element I'm particularly obsessed with now. Um, in the philosophy of information, agency is not necessarily human or biological. Um, and that also means that there is... Uh, Artificial evil, for instance. Uh, so we can actually think on, within sort of certain levels of abstraction of uh, data or informational beings being not human and also being morally um, active, moral agents. So we can have 
bots as moral agents. We can have software viruses. Or we can analyze the morality of a software virus. We can also analyze the morality, well, we could probably analyze the morality of a database as an agent, uh, which is a very powerful notion, um, especially when we think about, uh, you know, games constituted, computer games constituted of a weird hybrid between a system uh, that it's uh, controlling our actions by, by rules, uh, giving us methods to interact with, giving us processes or procedures to interact with, but also sort of populated by system control agents or bots. Um, the fact that we can think about the morality of an artificial intelligence, it's an enormously rich uh, approach. And the fact that we can consider it on similar grounds to a the morality of a human agent or a player, uh, it's, it's actually really fascinating. Um, and I'll go into that uh, later on today. So uh, when we analyze uh, the infosphere, when we analyze games, all agents should be uh, taken into consideration, be those human or artificial, or even the very same system of rules that evaluates our um, actions and that generates the, the game in itself. And the, the way of analyzing this would be the method of abstraction, which is... Um, basically, it has its roots in object-oriented programming and sort of computer science, uh, and that's uh, the basic claim is that when we analyze an infosphere, we should do it uh, approaching it on di different levels of abstraction. For those of you, I mean, probably you're all familiar with this, but for those of you who are not familiar with the idea of levels of abstraction, the best example out there is David Beckham. So when we think about David Beckham, it's terrible to sort of mention David Beckham at the Philosophy of Games conference, but... There, there, there he goes. So he is uh, a fashion item, right? He is um, a brand in himself. He is, um, he is a celebrity. And some people even claim that he's a football player. Um, when we try to understand who David Beckham is, we have sort of a, a large number of tags that we can put to him. But if we want to analyze him as a football player, well, it really doesn't matter for whom he does... Uh, publicity or how many sort of, you know, if he wears his wife's underwear. We don't care about all those elements. We care about his position in the game system. The fact that he plays on the right wing and he sort of cannot run and only uses his right leg and all these things. So using the level of abstraction or the method of ab abstraction means taking this very complex, complex object, uh, David Beckham, and uh, sort of extracting a level of abstraction in which we can analyze his sort of position or role as a player and then uh, sort of multiply it. I have just, uh, okay, more shameless self-promotion. I have just published an article in Ethics and Information Technology where I apply the uh, method of abstraction to the, or I combine it with the uh, Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil, which I find uh, particularly interesting for video games. Um, so basically, in, in that article, I claim that uh, one of the moral dangers of video games is, is uh, the generation of banality of evil by actually obscuring the player's uh, appropriation of different levels of abstraction. So um, if we cannot, if, if as players we don't see uh, or we are abstracted of uh, the consequences of our actions, so just imagine that you are sort of playing a game that it's corrupting your files. Um, have any of you played Execution? No. It's a, execution is a sort of a tiny uh, indie game made by an uh, indie game designer called Jesse Venbrooks. Um, very small, very tiny. Uh, the game can only be played once. Um, and it's, it's, sort of, it's pretty fascinating because we don't know that. Uh, and the way we play that game, uh, it obscures. We, we tend to think, you know, all games are replayable. Uh, but that game does not do that. That game actually, once, once you play it, you're done. Um, and, and in that sense, it's a little bit sort of, it's appropriate to analyze that game from or within this perspective because we are very used to thinking, well, you know, we can play the game several times. So what if we cannot play the game several times? It's the same discussion as permadeath, but it, um, okay, I'm going elsewhere. The method of ab abstraction is a, it's fascinating and it's very useful because it's a very a powerful analytical tool to, to understand games uh, from an informational ontology perspective. Uh, all this will make sense as soon as I introduce the model. So anyway, um, in summary, the philosophy of information offers uh, an informational ontology that is very useful for understanding games as systems, but also uh, agency beyond humans. And uh, I think it's also very good because it, uh, it helps understanding the ethics of games. 
uh, and other philosophical questions. Um, I'm particularly interested in the ethics of games. So most of my work is, is on this uh, area. And, you know, I thought, now that, now that we all know each other, I'll go for an easy question, uh, what games are. Um, I, I presume you've solved this question about sort of halfway into the first day, yeah? So, yeah, I'm sorry I'm late for, for the party. Um, but anyway, um, games are weird things. Um, and that's it. Questions? No, games are, are very interesting objects. Games are, are constituted of an artistic, let's call it like that, layer, right? Games have, or most games have um, a, a visual layer. Uh, board games all have uh, visual layers of sorts. Games have, uh, video games have some kind of sort of textures, uh, models, uh, uh, scenarios, levels, architectures. They have a number of uh, sound files that are played in particular order. They are, they have uh, arts. They are constituted by an artistic domain. They have an artistic domain. Um, however, sort of people like me, uh, ludologists, we, we don't like this level, right? Because, you know, oof, it, it sort of, it would imply that games can tell stories. Oh. Um, so we focus on systems. I have a PhD student who calls me a ludofascist because I only think about um, video games as systems and I don't care about everything else. Um, and this is what we interact with, right? So, so we have this sort of uh, beautiful picture of, of, you know, when, when you're saving the, the little uh, sister in Bioshock. And it's, it's a moment of intense emotional um, drama. And it's conveyed by, you know, the use of a blur filter, the, the shine, the number of colors, uh, the way it sort of, it uses delay and slow motion on, on the arms. Um, but actually what we do is, we, we don't do this, right? We don't perform that kind of, uh, you know, artistical, uh, emotional experience. What we do is actually choose, um, you know, should I just uh, harvest or should I rescue her? Because underlying this whole sort of beautiful aesthetics, it's just a system. A game is just a system, uh, kind of. When we analyze games, we have this problem that we have a procedural level, which is uh, rules and mechanics and uh, agents and, and, you know, the, the methods that communicate all these things output, scores, ending condition, winning condition, we have a game loop. We have tons of different systems and we communicate them uh, using um, arts or visual elements or sound elements or even tactile elements. Um, and I guess sort of the, the main problem with the ontology of games is trying to you know, combine how, how do these two work together. And there's been many solutions, so I'll, I'll try not to step on, on many people's toes. I, I'm not going into that discussion in which, you know, can games tell stories? I honestly don't care. I'm, yeah, that's, I don't care. If games tell stories, good for them. If games don't tell stories, good for them. I don't care. I'm not going into the ludology versus narratology because I, I really don't want to go there. Uh, what I want to do is save the problem uh, for understanding ethical gameplay of what games are, what kind of objects are they, and how can we build them. And um, for those purposes, I have a model that will save the world. I, and sort of at first, before I show it to you, I have to warn you, I'm really bad at doing models. So it's probably aesthetically hurting. Um, so with apologies, uh, this is the model that saves the world. Oh, damn it, I, I was expecting some kind of, oh yes, now I get it. Um, that's a game. Uh, taken in its more beautiful boxes and things like that. Uh, the outer rim, the infosphere, uh, should be understood as um, the game in itself. Uh, so encapsulating, uh, this is an analytical approach as well as an ontological one. That's the game outside, so Bioshock is an infosphere. Um, in order to analyze that uh, um, object, Bioshock, we have to look or we, we can analyze it in different gradients of abstraction, sort of uh, compound systems of, of levels of abstraction. At the core of any game and for having a game, we have a procedural gradient of abstraction or a system. Um, all games have systems. 
They can be systems of one rule, like um, Calvin ball, um, which is a sort of a beauty, you know Calvin ball, right? Or I'll change, no, Calvin and Hobbes? Oh, okay, anyway, Calvin, Calvin ball, it's, it's the game uh, created by Calvin in the cartoon Calvin uh, and Hobbes and the other has one rule, and that's that the rules can change, uh, which is brilliant. Uh, those of you who play Flux, the card game, will probably so be familiar with that idea. Anyway, at the core of any game, there are rules, and I call that the procedural gradient of abstraction. All the systems that contribute to creating the basic interaction between a game and a player, and a game and other agents, and agents between them. In its more uh, core systemic uh, nature, it's a state machine. Um, uh, of course, so computer scientists would probably jump and say, like, not all games can be considered state machines, but let's just take state machine as a metaphor. So it's basically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a state machine that is checking its state constantly. Um, against, uh, so it's evaluating rules, evaluating actions, and responding to them appropriately. Uh, in, in sort of basic terms, it's a game loop. Um, and that's where the rules are, that's also where the mechanics are, that's also where sort of all the methods that allow us to interact with the game are. Uh, players or agents that interact with that state machines are, I, I define them as uh, mechanical agents. Um, when you play, so there's this uh, slightly famous study of Quake uh, 2 players that, you know, they turn down the graphics, I guess you're probably familiar with it anyway. Uh, so you, so you, turn, you turn down the, sort of the graphic resolution of, of, the, of the game and you just sort of play the bare naked game. Uh, players that play things like uh, Drop 7 or Tetris are familiar with sort of this idea of a very mechanistical thinking. The, the aesthetics are not important. We just interact with the system and we try to grok it. There's no need for understanding what, you know, what the game means. Uh, the mechanical agent is any agent that uses the, the heuristics or a set of heuristics to optimize their behavior within uh, the procedural gradient of abstraction in her interactions with the state machine. So it's basically uh, the agent that creates st optimal strategies um, and acts upon them. Uh, I'm, I, 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 I used to be very fond of procedural rhetorics, the whole sort of Ian Bogus thing, the fact that you know mechanics is the message and so on. The claim that you know mechanics can uh, influences and so on, uh, basically claims that whatever is in the state machine can have a meaning, semantic meaning, uh, and it affects uh, our behaviors. I think it's wrong because it's encapsulated on an area where we don't need things like morality. You don't need morality to play StarCraft 2 or StarCraft. You don't need morality to play or to create optimal strategies for playing StarCraft. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, playing abstract systems, it's very fascinating for some people, but most of us actually like the shiny graphics. Um, much more, we actually need all these kind of uh, shiny graphics in order to play. We need metaphors. Uh, game design is communicating, game design is as much constructing that state machine as communicating it by means of metaphors. Um, there's a very common metaphor called life, right? So Mario has three lives, or uh, there's a life bar. You know, a light bar is just numbers. We could actually, hardcore WoW players know the numbers they are playing. They don't look at, you know, how much mana they have. They just know the numbers. Um, but the rest of sort of human beings and not those Borg people, we like the metaphors. We like to see sort of the depleting uh, mana. We like to see sort of our life bar going down. It communicates things very well. And uh, it, it also kind of helps to have some, some sort of cultural meaning that, that attaches to our actions, so we, we know what to do. Um, things like the, the, the infamous prostitute hack in the Grand Theft Auto series, right? So mechanically, it's basically a power-up, and it's a, it's a very elegant one, right? So, so, you know, you interact with, you go towards this agent, you interact with it, you lose some token, you, you all know the prostitute hack, right? So you, you interact, you, you exchange some tokens, uh, your token count goes down, the, the, agents, the other agent's token count, go, count goes up. Um, but because you have a method, particular method of interacting with other agents that allows you to eliminate them and, and then uh, sort of 
collect those tokens, then you just sort of go to the other agent after you've exchanged, eliminate them, collect tokens back. Now that's really polemic. Now the moment in which we stop saying agent and we say like player, prostitute, and money, and sex, whoa, things start getting interesting, right? On the lower domain, on the, on the state machine, it's just sort of, you know, conventional uh, exchange of information. On the semantic level, on the metaphors that we've been using to communicate the game, uh, things get muddier. We use cultural conventions, we use uh, aesthetic conventions, we also use um, moral conventions to communicate that system to the player, because we like those things. We like metaphors to communicate. And uh, those metaphors are evaluated by an ethical agent, by an epistemic agent, an agent that is able of translating or actually coupling both the mechanical or procedural meaning of these actions and their cultural uh, uh, meaning. So we play morally, we, we can feel disgust over the, the prostitute hack or we can just say, well, you know, it's a, it's a system thing, but we need to be on that sort of outer level, on the semantic gradient of abstraction. So this is how games work. We basically build systems that are uh, sort of in, uh, or designed to interact with an agent that does not need to use cultural knowledge, uh, but we communicate them to an agent that uses cultural knowledge to decode the actions and act upon them. Um, okay, so I should have so, a little bit, the procedural gradient of abstraction is basically the rules, the mechanics, or the system, uh, the, also sort of the methods to interact between agents, and it constitutes the basics of the, of the game's procedural rhetoric. Uh, but in this perspective, it's focused on, on the heuristic for, heuristics for uh, optimal actions and strategies. The interesting part about the ethics of games, and of many other objects, as you will probably see, comes from the semantic gradient of abstraction. That's not a Photoshop uh, picture. That's an actual toy. Um, I learned from a very esteemed former colleague and friend, Gonzalo Frasca, that if we want to understand things, we should look at toys. That toy exists. Um, it's a replica of the 1963 uh, Continental Car, I think it was called, uh, in which JFK was killed. It's a toy. It's a functional toy. We can sort of put it on, on the ground, we can drive, you can buy it on eBay. Um, it's one of the most disturbing toys you can find out there. Uh, I think, I, I have another example which are sort of small uh, bacteria plush toys, which are really lovely, but I, I forgot to bring mine today, so I'm sorry, you'll have to stay with uh, JFK. Why is this toy um, disturbing? Because it operates exactly how ethical gameplay or ethical experiences with games should work. We have a toy, we have a, an object that has a number of affordances and constraints for its behavior. You give this toy car to a child, they will just put it on the ground and do sounds and move it around and so on. For what it matters, they, they may even sort of build a street and put snipers on the corners. It's part of the game. The, ga the, the object is disturbing, not for what it is as a toy, it's a car. It's a toy car. We've seen it before. It's for its semantic layer. It's, it's, you know, it's the JFK car. It's the car where he was killed. It's a simulation of that car. It even lacks that arm, which I think is very appropriate. It makes it even more creepy. Um, there is a tension here between the procedural and the semantic. The procedural is telling us, you know, hey, play with me. I'm a toy car. The semantic is telling us, oh, whoa, it's JFK's car. Beware. Um, so, the way uh, in which we can, I, I believe, create ethical gameplay, it's this way. By instead of trying to incorporate a, a very sort of tight coupling between um, the semantic and the procedural, by breaking that coupling, by breaking our conventions of, you know, what the game wants us to do has to be good or bad, by letting us decide as epistemic agents how are these relations constructed? Um, because the experience of games is not only experiencing the game system, as a ludofascist like me would say, uh, it's also experiencing, a, it's, it's actually it's experiencing a game system through the metaphors that we are given. And um, if we want to understand 
ethical gameplay, it's not about building choices. Because when we create uh, systems of choices, trees, decision trees, we are just building obscure procedural systems that you know, don't appeal to our values. Um, what we need is to actually think about how we build a system and communicate it to an, a player that will couple both of them. Uh, and that's what we haven't done yet. So, in order to sort of understand ethical gameplay, we need to move away from the convention that, you know, the rules are the message, the procedures are the message. We need to move away from this. And I know, so if, if, if you ever read something I've written or, or, or heard me before, you know how much I deeply hate Knights of the Old Republic. Because, um, you know, it's the ethical game for excellence. It's, it's, it's the game that defines ethics. Knights of the Old Republic, I mean, besides being based on that sort of cheap uh, franchise called Star Wars, which is, God, I mean, yeah, don't get me started on that. Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings have done more harm to video games than, you know, all Eric and Dylan's and Columbine's out there. And that's on video, right? Oh, God. Anyway, uh, I really don't like Star Wars and, and the Lord of the Rings. And I don't like Star Wars because it generates this kind of shallow ethical gameplay. So, so in Knights of the Old Republic, you go around with this character and then you can take sort of very complex choices, like should I choke them or do I try to talk with them? Um, and we, of course, we don't by any moment doubt that choking is bad and talking to them is good. Um, so we're given these, these choices and then we're being evaluated by this system that tells us, well, given your decisions, Taking up to this moment, you're probably on the dark side. It's an interesting metaphor, dark. Anyway, um, this is not ethical gameplay. This is a strategy thinking. You don't need to understand what the meaning of the system is. You don't need to understand what the meaning of the metaphor is. Does any of you understand who the Sith Lords are after playing this game? Why, why are they evil? I mean, for, for what it... For what I can imagine, the Jedi people just go around being self-righteous and, you know, gathering children and putting them in, in particular schools. You know, it sounds like, you know, Waco alike. And, and yeah, yeah, so the Sith Lords, yeah, they, they like to paint their faces like drag queens and they like to choke people. So what? You know, maybe in their cultures that's interesting. That's, and, you know, okay, that's a little bit of a bad joke. But um, we don't get to understand why the Sith Lords are evil. We don't, we don't get to understand why being a Jedi is good. We don't even get to understand why, you know, what's the dark side? What? We don't get it. We, we don't need to think about it. We don't know that, you know, if, if I choke them, I will become a Sith Lord. Ah. Yeah, so what's the, what's the meaning of that? What's the values of that? Um, ethical gameplay, it's a much more complex thing. It's, it's an experience, for once, uh, in which... Uh, we are basically, as players, we are basically uh, faced with a number of um, procedures, actions, meanings, uh, roads to take, paths, um, and the evaluation or the actions we need to take in order to explore them are evaluated not by means of a strategy but by means of our cultural knowledge, uh, also within the game. So, we need to think beyond strategies in order to experience uh, ethical gameplay. We need to think morally. We need to take non-optimal decisions. We need to take optimal decisions that will create harm. We need to think about who we are in this game. What, does, what, what, what is our moral position within this game experience? And act upon them. It has to give us the option of acting upon that uh, moral position. And games have not done that uh, so far. Um, it, it often works by sort of putting an ethics-based tension between uh, the procedural and the semantic. So in, in games uh, like uh, Knights of the Old Republic, once we are in the procedural level and we're saying like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a Sith Lord, then that's bad. And then sort of it's communicated to the player in a consequent way. So you know that Sith Lords are bad and therefore all these settings to be evaluated in a negative way and, you know, that's it. You, you know how to be bad, um, which is it's very comfortable. And you also know how to be good. You don't, you don't need to apply ethical thinking. The system is thinking for you. Um, you don't need an ethical agent. A bot could play uh, code or 
becoming a Sith Lord with no problems. Um, it's actually fair. Ethical game, uh, so an ethical game, the one that I dream of, cannot be played by the type of synthetic agents we have now, because they, they only work on, on sort of the game system, on the mechanical level. Um, maybe we need to think about other types of agents. Uh, so these type of games I dream of, and they exist. Uh, they require a player. Um, and if you revise uh, ethi uh, game design literature, you will see that sort of in the background of most descriptions of, of player types, uh, it's the, so the whole idea of the homoludens or homoludens. And is that what we really need? Um, oh, no. We should get rid of homoludens. You know, blow it out of the door, let's think about a new anthropology. We need to think in a better way uh, what players are. Because who plays games? Is it just the, the, sort of the person in, engaged in this type of closed, systemic, self-contained um, experience that uh, makes sense within that particular environment and sort of magic circle? And once we are out of it, or once we introduce in it things like morality, as we think that says, uh, then, then it sort of breaks down. If you remember by the end of um, uh, Homo Ludens, uh, Huizinga claims that the moment in which we have to use things like compassion or anything about morality, uh, there's no play. Because play and, and sort of other types of things, are, are like morality thinking, are exclusive. There is no place in, in, uh, of, for morality in games. I think that's the quote. Um, and that's a very pervasive uh, way of thinking. It has in influenced the, our player models in, in game design literature. Uh, and we build games for these homoludens. We build games for this uh, agent that does not require moral thinking to play. Um, it does not require to import values in order to play. Um, we just need to sort of engage in this encapsulated action and preserve it. And while it works, uh, it's fine. Uh, but the moment in which we introduce moral thinking, by the moment uh, the agent has to think in a way that it's not optimal for the game, then the game breaks down. Um, not even Gadamer in, in his take on play has uh, criticized the fact that Homo Ludens is, is largely an, an amoral uh, anthropology. Um, and that's, that's okay. So, so in, in, sort of in the conventional understanding of games, in the historical understanding of games, Homo Ludens don't need more morals to play games. Actually, if we use morals, you know, things can go wrong, game-wise, as game experience. So, the moment came in which sort of game designers thought, let's create games that explore ethical dilemmas. And uh, since we cannot introduce ethical thinking, uh, we will go towards consequentialism. And actually, we will do this if-else uh, or if-or structures um, that are very, very comfortable. You know, the player does not need to think. The player just needs to sort of acknowledge, okay, there is a morality system A, morality system B, I'll just go towards one or the other. I'll just evaluate the consequences of my actions. There's no really deep uh, ethical thinking. There's not really engaged ethical thinking. There's no uh, sort of Aristotelian phrenesis there. We just need to sort of choose. Um, these uh, three systems are also very interesting to... Uh, game designers, computer game designers, because they match very well what computer scientists uh, do. It's, you know, if else structure. So that's why we have them. They are very comfortable to code, they are very comfortable to understand, and they are what, you know, the anthropology of, of games has sort of showed us. Um, we need to go away from it. Fallout 3, it's, it's, it's my poster boy lately. Such a brilliant game. If they only had gotten rid of the karma system, but that's another story. Um, in the philosophy of information, in information ethics, there's this concept of the homopoieticus, sort of a constructivist take on ethics, by which it is a duty as agents within a system, not only to participate in it, but also to sort of preserve its well-being and contribute to it. So we cannot be just passive button mashers. We cannot be just uh, passive recipients of, of um, moral systems that you know, we just intake and operate within. We have to create them. We have to be active. We have to live by these principles. We are giving an environment. We have to uh, 
preserve it and create for it. It's, it's the whole concept of creative stewardship. Um, think about follow three, it works like that. Follow three gives you a world. It's up to you how you want to live. And uh, I, I, I guess all of us that have played the game, um, we have different takes. I killed everybody except, except ghouls and slaves. Literally, everybody. In, in my wasteland, there's, no, there's only ghouls and slaves. Um, and I kind of feel nice about it. Um, Tempani Tower. It's the most interesting uh, ethical gameplay example I've come across in a long time. Um, again, Fallout 3, Tempani Tower is this tower where, you know, a heavily armed this group of humans try to sort of live as they lived uh, before the, the nucle nuclear war. Um, and they, they are kept uh, sane and under control by the fact that so their leader is telling them that ghouls are out there and they want to kill you. So as a player, you can go to the ghouls and, and say like, no, actually, we don't really want to kill them. We hate them, but we, we, you know, we want to share resources. So of course, the, the first time I played the game, I, was just kind of, I, I played it in a very hippie way. Like, okay, I want everybody to get along to each, with each other. And, you know, I wanted to see the, sort of the ending of Fallout where you just sit around the fire and play Kumbaya. Um, so so I, I broke a deal between the ghouls and the humans at Tempeni Tower saying like, okay, you know, why don't you live together? Why can't we be friends? Um, and they, they sort of got together at the beginning. They, the, the end of the mission, I got some points, uh, got some weapons and so on. You know, ghouls would live in Tempeni Tower, humans would live in Tempeni Tower. After some hours of gameplay, I returned to Tempeni Tower and all the ghouls have killed the humans. Um, because, you know, after all, you know, humans are humans, so we, we can kill them. Brilliant. I couldn't foresee that. So I took, you know, the morally consequent choice with who I am uh, at that sort of stage of play. I wanted to be the Kumbaya player. Um, so I tried to break a deal, and, and it, it was not the ethical wise choice. Um, second time I played, I killed everybody, which couldn't be good because I knew that they were going to be sort of backstabbing bastards. And that also felt good towards my own moral system as, as the player of Fallout 3. Fallout 3, does not, there's also another mission called Oasis, which is brilliant, um, in which you sort of have to s decide either you kill, you know, it's a consequentialist classic dilemma, but it's very, it's, because you don't see the outcome, it's really interesting. Um, you either kill a mutant and, you know, alleviate it from its pain, or you use it for sort of some kind of experiment. Um, anyway, I have to rush. I, I, I saved it, I think, so I can save from, from his misery. Anyway, in general, what we need to do is translate a really old concept to game design. Uh, the games we have now, in Kantian terms, um, force uh, are, are sort of, or creates a heteronomy, right? So we take these sort of systems, we have to live by them, are they really true? What we have to create is more autonomous players. We have to give them an opportunity to live by their values. And the tricky thing translate these things, right? But this is the so summary points of what I've been saying. Uh, players need to be respected and encouraged as autonomous moral beings. <coughs> don't force them an ethical system. Uh, don't force them into an ethical system. So how do we do these things? Like that, this is, this is the, sort of, the slide that would make me rich. Um, we need to go to interfaces to understand how do we create these things. This is Blender which is probably a, one of the best uh, open source modeling and game engine tools out there, which God knows it's impossible to know how it works if you only look at the screenshot. It's terrible. So those of you who are familiar with interaction design theory are for probably uh, familiar with the concept of cognitive friction. Alan Cooper coined this in uh, the inmates are running the asylum and basically said that good interaction design avoids cognitive friction. So when you look at an interface, those of you who are sort of wise enough to have an OS X or, or sort of a custom-made Linux probably know about the avoidance of uh, cognitive uh, friction. We know, we look at an object, we know how it works. Um, you know, there's no, there's no doubt about how a bottle works, right? And the same goes with interfaces. Interfaces should get out of the way and they should avoid cognitive friction. Um, we should understand how they work and become one with them. If we want to make uh, ethical games, we have to go the other way around. We have to create as much cognitive friction as possible. Um, so within sort of reasonable limits. 
And I call that uh, ethical cognitive dissonance. This is going to be the subject of a talk in, at a conference in um, Tampere in a month's time. So I will put up some slides explaining what I actually mean by ethical cognitive dissonance um, in a month's time. So check out my website if you're interested or we can talk afterwards. Um, but, you know, since, since I only have four minutes to go, I'll explain it with Shadow of the Colossus, the most fantastic ethical game uh, out there, I think, or one of them. You know, and there are no choices in this game. So Shadow of the Colossus is brilliant because, um, you know, it puts you in the, in the position of this hero. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a sort of a young man uh, trying to rescue this sort of helpless lady. And then, you know, you fight these colossi and then you, 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 know, you climb them and you stab them in the head. And then, wow, you've, you've succeeded killing this monster. And then when you finish killing this colossi, you, you fall to the ground and... and black sort of strings pour into you and you felt kind of dead. And then you wake up and your avatar looks sick. And the more colossal you kill, the more sick you look. But in terms of gameplay, the more stamina you have, so you can climb higher. Um, this game is playing with our convention. So all the morality of Shadow of the Colossus, which is very deep and very complicated, works on uh, forcing us to identify using game conventions. You know, we all like the heroes and much more have a horse and they are alone. Um, we like winning. We enjoy winning. Winning is good, right? We, winning is fantastic. Uh, and then we get contradictory information. Well, maybe winning is not the right thing in this game. Um, our avatar looks sick. What's the point of, of what we are doing? Um, all the values, all the morality of Shadow of the Colossus, it's in the player's head. It's not systemic. It's the way we experience. It's actually built on a very basic system of contradiction, of ethical di uh, cognitive dissonance applied. Our actions have some kind of ethical feedback using the semantic level of the game. Um, our avatar looks more and more sick. By the end of the game, we die. Um, so, and whatever we've done is particularly evil. But the more colossal we kill, the more stamina we get. So the game becomes easier. So the procedural level actually says, well, what you're doing is good. And the semantic level is saying, well, what we are, you are actually doing may not be good. Uh, it's manipulating information. It's pitching both the semantic and the procedural level against each other. Um, it is not a method, but it can be applied in a very systematic way. Uh, it's a technique, like uh, pointillism or uh, whatever, uh, perspective. It's a technique for uh, designing games, uh, focused on engaging the player not as a homo ludens, but as a homo poieticus, as a creative being that will appropriate the system, preserve it, and create values uh, within it. And by applying uh, ethical cognitive dissonance, we increase our autonomy. At no stage in uh, Shadow of the Colossus, we are told this is good or bad. It's only our appropriation of the game that, that tells us. At no stage in uh, the whole Tenpenny Tower uh, solution of, of the problem, we were told, well, you know, you may be doing something wrong. We are just left alone. We have to build the values we want to live <coughs> and play by. Um, so what we have to do is actually get rid of choices. You know, we think about, you know, video games have to give choices. No. Forget about choices. Screw them. Um, Call of Duty 4. Death from above. And there's a mission in which, I know I'm running out of time, so... Um, there's a mission in which we are in this sort of big uh, plane. We are killing uh, dots on a screen. It's alienating. It's extremely scary. And it's enormously fascinating because that's how war is waged. Um, Call of Duty 4 plays many tricks on the player. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about Call of Duty 4 as a moral game, I have to be done now. So I'll run into the future. And the future is not human. Uh, at least the future of my research is not human. I'm a little bit tired of dealing with humans. Uh, we are also unpredictable. You're also unpredictable. So I'm not an anymore. Goodbye. I want artificial agents because we are the robots. Uh, you know, information ethics allows us to think about agency and moral agency beings. So can we create ethically sentient but I would say we do, or yes, we can. Um, 
Because instead of creating heuristics for optimal strategies for playing, what if we give some kind of heuristics for the cultural meaning of actions? What if we teach them, uh, sort of, what if we make these bots that learn about also the semantic layer of the game and not only the procedural? We need to unchain the, un them from the procedural and create some kind of uh, silicium poeticus or agents that can learn from morality. Um, and no, I know I don't talk about the singularity here. I'm just saying this is the most promising avenue I think right now, creating morally sentient agents. And with this, I have to say, uh, oh, it's been a rush. Thanks. And uh, questions, feedback, and anything. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's a very good question. I was not very clear. I'll rewind on my slides and show you why Kotor doesn't work. Um, tut tut. Okay, I, I thought it would be faster to rewind. Uh, Kotor doesn't work because it has uh, this thing over there. You don't need to think about good and evil. There's a system that translates it for you. Morality is embedded in the procedural system. Um, and this is the player really need to think about good and bad, or the, the, the nature of good and bad. It is already processed for her. Um, Set of the Colossus is brilliant because it gets rid of that. So it, it's totally true. It has a good and bad system there. Uh, but we don't know it. We have to relate to it. We have to, we have to think, well, maybe you know, saving this girl is more important than something else. Maybe than dying. Maybe than freeing this, this sort of power. We don't know. Yeah, I, I would prefer that the ethical meaning of games goes to the semantic layer more than the procedural layer. Yeah, that's why I'm annoyed at Fallout 3, which makes it beautifully until you go into the stats screen and you see the Skarma stuff. That it's just ridiculous because you don't need it. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, one of the main problems is that we are translating everything to the procedural and, and we are communicating it through the procedural instead of just letting players, you know, obscuring that layer and letting players think well, what's going on behind the scenes. Who am I in this game? Yeah, I would be happier without this screen. I, I would say um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not against telling stories, but just don't tell, you know, don't tell some of my colleagues. Um, no, no, um, I, I like games telling compelling ethical stories. Um, and I think that's one way of, of doing it. Call of Duty 4 works very well because it uses this sort of heavy authorial narrative, or whatever you want to call it, semantic layer, um, to convey ethical experiences. However, if we don't think exclusively about stories, but also about the semantics, then we, have, uh, then we can analyze things like uh, um, diplomacy, the board game, as also an ethical game. And it's not constructing any kind of story, but, but we build who we are in that game also by means of this system. So stories play a very large role because they are one set of, of metaphors that we use to communicate uh, this procedural system uh, that we know. But I want to go sort of beyond and say sort of multiplayer mechanics 
which are very abstract can be communicated also in a way that are not narrative, that have a cultural meaning and that create ethical experiences. I have nothing against the stories. Last question, yeah? No, 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 it's just because... So I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to say. Um, I I think that's the, the core of this ethical cognitive dissonance is is the operations between the semantic and the procedural. More than decoupling them, we need to operate on that on that domain in between them. So that's that's my main point. Okay, guys. Uh, time to disoccupy. Uh, until uh, quarter past ten.